So one of the things that Vant said with his, just in his little preface, was that God is faithful, and that that's kind of the the theme of mine. Uh, so my word or my name or whatever they they call it was was fire, and while Vant has hit him like as soon as he got it, um, people are kind of all over the spectrum as far as that goes, and. You know, it, sometimes sometimes it's as soon as you get it, you know exactly what it means, and sometimes you kind of have to work it on a little while and mull it over and kind of kind of dig a little bit, and it takes a little more time for it to to kind of sink in and kind of figure out what it means to you. So, the definition when they when you get the sheet, it kind of has the the word and kind of some definitions because there's kind of a root form and then some kind of alternate forms and that kind of thing. So mine was the root was kind of the heat of the sun or fiery lightning and the alternate form was to kindle or to be ignited to to glow or to be refined uh, was was the was fire and I brought Evie by myself this morning so it was a little harried and so I don't, I don't have my bracelet this morning so you guys will have to forgive me on that. Um, so when I started out the weekend, he also used the word skeptical. That's that's where I was as well. Uh, skeptical or apprehensive is maybe a little nicer word, but uh, same place. Um, but as the weekend progressed, the skepticism turned to faith uh, because of some some deep digging, some soul searching, and uh, most importantly, I think because God God met me there in a way that I, that I haven't experienced him before. I don't think. Um, and like I said, it took me about halfway through the weekend before my word really, before my word really hit me. So we were going through a portion of the day uh, where we were kind of dredging into our personal weaknesses, um, and it occurred to me that that one of mine for some time has been uh, a lack of commitment on a personal level to God, or more specifically to His Word and and the study or or meditation on it. Um, it seems looking back over most of my life, um, I've just kind of excused myself as being too busy or told myself that I'll have more time after this or that or kind of fill in the blank. Um, during high school, I went to ABS and so like we had chapel every day and we had Bible class every day and that was kind of a, an ex- a built-in excuse there. Well, you know, I don't have to, I have to study when I get home because we have, we have study there and then uh, at FC, it was kind of the same thing. Like, hey, we had Bible class every day there. And, okay, whatever, it's, it's fine. Um, and so it just never became a personal habit for me. And then, I mean, it seems pretty reasonable. Like, it's easy to rationalize. And then after that, you know, it's, it's pharmacy school, and it's marriage, it's new jobs, it's little kids, it's always something work related and all of these things like they're nothing to sneeze at from a standpoint of time commitments and uh, things of of that nature but what hit me like a ton of bricks is that this is exactly how our enemy wants us to see it Um, he's always going to be willing to give me something to keep me busy uh, and to keep me from dedicating any kind of substantial time to study or prayer (coughs) even if those things are harmless in and of themselves. Um, so that, that kind of apathy is just not okay. And so I have to, to kindle and stoke the fire uh, that's within and allow God to do the same. Uh, so if we want to have a good, healthy relationship with, with someone, and it can be anyone, we know that we have to spend time with them. Like whether you're talking about Uh, your spouse, your kids, your parents, your friend. Like, you know that you can't have a good, healthy relationship with somebody that you don't spend time with. And we know just on that same basic level that that's true with God, too. It's just just basic reasoning. Uh, So I couldn't help but be reminded of the thorny ground from the parable of the sower. It's from Matthew 13, and I'll just read a little bit of it. 
And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. So a little bit later, he's explaining it to them. And the one that I want to kind of hone in on was the, was the thorns. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Uh, so the, the worry of the world can, can just be so suffocating sometimes. Uh, but God forbid we let us choke it out from our, from our Heavenly Father. And so I'm, I'm convicted of this even as we stand here today because it's been two weeks. It's just been two weeks since I've been there. And it's, it's been a, a really, it's been something that I haven't really changed since I've been back. So um, that even after such a great weekend at Z, there have been some things that I've made improvements in, but just breaking those habits and getting into new habits of personal study and all that, uh, it's just, just so difficult. Um, but something that I was just really incredibly struck with while I was out there was was just how good God is, God is to forgive and to restore us. Uh, he's faithful even when we are not. Uh, and that, like I said, that's kind of the, the overarching theme of what I wanted to talk about. Um, and that was what Vance said just a second ago. Psalm 51 is just an amazing example of this. Um, and it was, it was kind of pointed out during a time of personal confession um, because that's exactly what it is. It's, it's, David, it's David's words after he was confronted with his sin with Bathsheba. Um, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to read it. So just listen and really you can read along if you want to or if you want to listen, that's fine. But just really focus on the words and just really kind of soak them in, uh, but, but hang in there with me on it. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create a clean heart and create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And sustain with me, sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of, a, of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good design, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. So I know this sounds probably a little bit silly or crazy, although probably not so much to those that have been out there. 
but sitting by myself on a ranch in Texas after having searched deeper into myself than I can ever remember searching and and really having prayed this prayer as my own, I felt a closeness to the Father that, that I've never felt before. It was like for the first time that I, that I felt like the truths were really, that the words were really meant for me and that they applied to me. Uh, they do. They, they, they apply to all of us. And God will do what David has asked him to do. He, he will create a clean heart in us and he will purify us and he will restore to us the joy of our salvation. Um, it was, I felt as if literal chains had been broken free from me as I, as I let go of the guilt, of the doubt, and the self-sufficiency. So please allow yourself to trust in Him and, and do the same. Just let go. Uh, so please believe me when I hope that, <laughs> that you all have gained something from this. Uh, but it's been much more inwardly directed than it has been outwardly directed. Uh, so just one last thing uh, before I before I uh, before I finish, and that's just so I just want to leave it with Philippians four four through eight. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any, any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Thanks so much for, uh, for letting us go.